Cool. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. So, really great to be here in Japan with a crew of people who continue to expand my mind about the possibilities of linked data and this somewhat forgotten corner of machine learning, um, or at least not, not overhyped. Maybe that would be the right way to describe it. Okay, so what I'd like to talk to you guys about is is a data structure that lets us encode the whole tree of life into one magical thing. In fact, we're already looking at it here. So our, our job is done, and we can go home. Uh, yay, okay, no, it's not really true. But what is this thing really showing us? So we have you know, all these different classifications of different species on the edge, and then as we go back in time through the center, we, we would imagine there's some kind of prototypical common ancestor um, and, and what does it mean to have a common ancestor? Genetically, it means that at some point in the past, uh, your genome was um, descended from some, some common genome, and you got some variants, maybe these little squiggles here, that would allow you to differentiate. So as you get a red squiggle, you could say that these species are separating. Maybe they become incompatible because of that little, little change. And another green one is separate. So again, maybe these aren't species. It's just a really, really detailed, awesome data structure we've made. It has like every single thing we could possibly care about in it. Um, and, and this is really great. And, and we totally want to use this in bioinformatics. We do inference and thinking about genomes. But uh, there's a few problems. And the first one is that we really can't observe all those genomes. And so historically, we've just picked one. We found one in nature. We picked it. And then we say, oh, we can reassemble this thing out of little read fragments. Now we have a reference genome. And, uh, and it's fine that it just fits here. It doesn't matter that there's a few differences, because those are just a few differences. It's not really a problem. Um, obviously, it is a problem because if you get really far up and down the tree, then the differences become so great that we can't really see what's going on anymore. And, and that really messes up our inference. So what I and several other people today are going to talk about is a process through which we can, we can model these differences in the same data structure. So now a reference has the variation and the sequence in, embedded in it. We don't have to think about all the references at the same time, which is expensive. And annoying, we could compress them down and say, well, this, this one genome graph, uh, it contains, or, or, okay, so I'll describe exactly what I mean by genome graph in just a second, but this one object can contain all the information that we're interested in in this other one um, in a much more compact space, and yet it isn't totally lossy. We still have those, those variants of interest in it. And so how would this thing work? Well, there's one way you could do it. So one way you can do the, the, the variation graph is that you have nodes that represent sequences. So they have labels. They might have other auxiliary information, like a position or a name, an ID. Uh, and then you could have edges that represent allowable linkages between them. And so you can go and sort of read off possible, um, pof possible sequences out of this graph. And you can read off ones that don't really exist in nature. So you might also want to record which ones you've seen. Um, and thus, recording you know, the, the kind of herringbone of that tree um, mixing metaphors, um, we can record all the sequences we care about using this reduced language of, of IDs or names in these nodes. And so some of you might recognize this as a Markovian system, uh, and that, that is problematic because if we don't remember these sequences, we get a very kind of memoryless and very lossy kind of representation of what's going on. So in fact, what, what I want to promote is that it's not just about the graph, it encodes all the information plus a lot of redundancy and things that don't exist, but actually the sequences uh, that we need to remember and think about using in the process of applying this technology. So another visualization of this, these are both programmatically generated, by the way, from, from VG uh, tools. VG is the toolkit I'm talking about today. Uh, so another visualization is that you would think about the, um, the sequence is actually threading through the nodes, and, and you could extend this to have very large numbers of sequences and really get an understanding of the relationship between them quickly. Uh, and in fact, I think that this might be much easier to interpret than many traditional uh, linear layouts uh, on the genome that relate different samples together. And of course, we're going to hear about that later. So uh, I've been working on this for a while. And uh, about, I guess it's been about a year ago, we finally broke into the mainstream press. We had this really interesting article about the application of this technology to sort of to reboot genomics, you might think, or like redo everything from the, from the ground up. And, and you may have noticed on the other slide, there are actually there are these little emojis in these scientific figures. Um, the emojis correspond to some hash of the name of the sequence. It's just so we can represent lots of things together. So uh, in this 
I get these figures in, into the into the article, and, and so I managed to get emojis into this popular science like press article, uh, which was pretty proud about. But it, it, some other interesting things happened. So it came up on Hacker News, which some of you might be familiar with. It's a link aggregator website. It's been around for a while. Uh, it's kind of a clone of Reddit or, or vice versa. I'm not really sure which one comes first. And and so it, there's this really funny comment where uh, basically this person, you can read it carefully. I think it's probably big enough for some of you. But they basically come and said, well, this is cool you're doing this. Um, who on earth came up with this idea of using one linear reference 16 years ago? Like, wasn't that obviously a problem? Like, didn't they think of the variation? Like, who, who was responsible for this? You know, didn't it already work this way? That, that's basically what they're saying. And so I had this feeling that I've been working for several years on this, and, and the world thinks that it, it already exists. Like, why, that's, of course that's how you do it. Like, why wouldn't you do it this way? And it's an interesting thing. It, it should be motivating, because uh, we're not doing this way. And that's in, innately what people, technical people maybe who come to this, think that we should be doing. And so, okay, so we've, we've made this tool chain, VG, standing for variation graph. And it, it's a collection of different algorithms that work on a common data type. The data type I showed you, which is a graph with labeled paths to it. And you can do a ton of stuff to it. You can do all the things that you do with traditional, um, like, NGS tools on a linear reference with the system. So we can do um, construction of these graphs. So we have a, a list of variant calls. We know a bunch of SNPs. We know some SVs. We have some indels. We can take that in a reference and turn it into a graph. And we can also do that with phased haplotypes through them. We can record in that graph where all the haplotypes go and compute on that. Uh, we can do, this is kind of described here, and we can have databases that store this in different ways. In fact, we can encode it in RDF. We can store it in RDF databases as triples. Uh, we can annotate the graph. So we say this part of the graph has a significance, just a name, and then connect that to other things we're interested in. We can simulate reads from it. There's different ways to do that, you can imagine. Uh, we can visualize it. You've seen some examples of that. And uh, so we can align reads against it. Right? So we have new things. And now this graph, um, the, the reference, of course, is always a prior. We kind of forget about it. Um, but now our graph is, is allowing us to have an extended prior. We get new sequences. We can infer where they fit in that extended prior, map them into it. Just the same operation that you have in something like BWAMM or Bowtie. And we can also do, we can take these reads and we can then do variant calling and phasing. Rather, the phasing isn't really worked out. I shouldn't get ahead of myself. But variant calling we can reliably do on top of this. And then finally, once you have the variant calls, those describe new updates to the graph. So now the same data structure can be updated. Your prior can be extended. And we can continue using it. And so we have tools that do all these things, and we test them. So does it work? What happens when you actually do a read alignment against a graph you've made from some data source? To say yes, but with some caveats. So what, what is this I'm showing you? I'm showing you a rock plot. It has some peculiarities. One is that we're uh, log scaling our false positive rate here. So this is um, 1 in 10 error down to 1 in, uh, one in 100,000. And then this is a, the true positive rate, the sensitivity, is scaled in terms of like a normal uh, float scale. And what's going on is that we've taken a, a panel of yeast that was an independently established pan genome, someone published. They said, we, we've got these 30 yeast strains. We sequence them. We align their genomes to one reference, and we put the SNPs in this file. So we take that file. We take one of these strains out, and we build a, a pan genome graph, a variation graph from the rest. From the one we've taken out, we, we then simulate reads. We know where they go. Um, because, because if we use the coordinate system of the reference to give us a projection between the two graphs. And then we can measure our accuracy at realigning those reads to the pan genome. And we can also measure the accuracy of realigning them to just the linear reference. And so we have in blue, so the darker colors are paired end mapping. It's this set here. The lighter ones are single ended here. The blue ones are BWA. The red ones are VG on the pan genome. And the green ones are VG on the reference only genome. And, and what you can see is that we actually don't do as well, even on the linear reference, with our, our mapper. as has BWAMM. And I can only say that we, we have bugs. And it's probably in the paired end resolution, because it looks different here than this. They're basically right on top of each other for single end. Uh, but there's another effect which is kind of interesting that we've become to appreciate. 
having, having done the simulation in this way, this, I think very realistic it mirrors what you actually get when you, when, you, um, when you do get a new sample, if you did the, have the pan genome. And that's that we, we sort of lose specificity when we align against the pan genome. Um, and you can see that so these two red lines are a bit below the other ones. Um, in the end, most of the data is in this bin here that says 60. It's a mapping quality 60. And, and so there's not a whole lot of difference between the different methods, practically speaking. Um, we'll keep moving. Um, yeah, so probably just leave this be. But this basically shows that if you take the simulated data um, and you look at the identity against the, the linear reference versus the pan genome, you always see that you're, you're doing, you're closer to the pan genome than not. And this is also true in real data in the same samples. Uh, and this is the same idea for human. Here we have a uh, sample that was not part of the pan genome where we know the phase of the two haplotypes. We can simulate from them and we see basically the same effect as we see on the yeast. Um, and I hopefully I explained that um, to not like ad nauseum before. Okay, so what else can we do? We see that this is basically the same performance. Uh, it's sufficient to do things like variant calling. And the way that variant calling works is that you have read alignments. You basically you can make a pileup that says where there's differences. You put those, those pileup variants into the graph to augment it, as I was saying, and then that you can project back to VCF. And so this is something that uh, the people on the team have worked on and, and actually got working pretty well. And so we participated in a challenge that uh, it was, it's called the Precision FDA Challenge, where there was a sample that we're supposed to analyze using some method. And uh, basically, we did very poorly. We got these F scores, 96%, uh, or rather, I guess the F score, yeah, yeah 95.6. Most of the methods are in, in the at least two or three nines kind of range. They're, they're very precise in the region they're being tested. We had a lot of bugs. Um, but we got a star for heroic effort because it took a heroic amount of compute to make it work at this state. This was in. May of 2016, and then by uh, September of 2016, about a year ago, we were able to improve this quite a bit. It runs faster. We're getting close to a 99% F measure, and I think you can see where this is going. There's more bugs to solve, but the method becomes more tenable. Uh, what, what I wanted to get to was that uh, it may be very underwhelming, I guess, these rock plots that show that if you map against the SNP pan genome, you kind of do a little bit worse. Um, if you map against the SNP and indel one with human, you basically do the same. Uh, what, what is really interesting to us are the variants that we, we have. And so we should really consider the, the effects at and around variants in the data set, because that's what we, we want to see. Um, we want to understand how different individuals are different from each other. And, and so this, this takes the, um, the genome in the bottle uh, truth set for NA12878. At sites where we know in the truth set, or at least the truth set says there's a variant here, we go and count the reads that are, are matching the reference and that are matching the alternate allele. And so I, I should clarify, in the truth set where we have a heterozygous variant. And so what we've, we've then done is this kind of like uh, controlled experiment at each site that says uh, how many reads are, are mapping to the reference versus the alternate. And uh, in the case of a linear uh, genome-based method like PWA, here we've called with, with um, three bays, we see that for SNPs, this is the length here, and this is the fraction of alternate allele, this kind of allele balance metric. See, for SNPs, we're basically perfect. We, we are, are right, right at 50-50, so we're not getting any bias from the SNPs alone. Um, and that's, that's effectively true for the pan genome method here in red, but as the allele length increases, it decreases, so the delta against reference gets bigger, uh, things get very, very strange. And in fact, we, we see that as we're looking at something that's a good fraction of a read length. I think these are 150 base pair reads. So when you're looking at something between the, like around a fifth of the read length, now we're only mapping, um, we're, we're mapping, uh, actually I didn't calculate this for. So it would be like having five times more affinity for the reference than that allele. And so that, that means that if we care about the things that are big, which have a big effect, we're not gonna see them very easily if we look just at a linear reference. And, and so you might, like just for verification, be sure that this is because of the graph. It's not some artifact of the way we're doing the alignment. So this is only alleles that are actually in the graph. Uh, and you see that this really shows the effect quite clearly. It's the same thing. And, and the, and the mm -hmm. negative is that if they're not in the graph, um, you know, the, the mapping does behave a little bit differently, but we do effectively see the same thing. 
in both methods. We're, we're biased toward the reference as well. So, yeah, so hopefully that, that clarifies what the toolkit is capable of, at least in terms of alignment and variant calling. Um, and, and also that as we think about variants that are bigger, then it becomes more important to think about them in a graphical concept, a context. Con, um, context. So what, what is going on with VG? Well, there is a paper that's been in progress for a long time. And uh, there's a draft available. You please come and ask uh, anyone who you might realize is part of this project for it. We'll be happy to share it. Uh, the, the current problem we have is the alignment speed. So we're about eight to 10 times slower than BWAMM. And that effectively makes you uh, untenable in this kind of space. So we're working on that. There's also something I didn't get into deeply, but uh, it's important to think about paths against the, the graph. Those provide you annotations, they provide you haplotypes, and uh, they, they link, link the graph into other data sources, other, other references, other things like this. Thus far, it's been difficult for us to make whole genome uh, compressed databases that we can query that type, but a member of the, of the group, Yoni Siren, has been, uh, has been developed a method to do this basically called GBWT. And, and we now have an API to that, which we'd like to integrate with. And, and also we want to explore novel applications, which we haven't gotten into here, such as RNA sequencing. And, um, and just how do you construct the, the graphical genome? Like what, what goes into it? Uh, it's difficult to assess this. And I, I won't get into this much because Adam will discuss it some, but we want to build human pan genome from public data uh, sources, including that in the Simon's Human Diversity Project. Okay, so with that, I want to thank everyone, well, not just these people, but men, the many people who've, who've uh, communicated with everyone working on this and also uh, contributed code. Uh, in particular, Richard Durbin, who's my advisor, I'm a PhD student at the Sanger, um, and also, of course, Toshiaki for, for helping to host us and bringing us all here. So thank you, and I'll take questions.